Hello, and welcome to Evaluating Nanoparticle Generation During Shredding of Nanocomposites for Recycling. My name is Pete Rayner from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, Division of Environmental Health Sciences. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Jessica Sabula, also from the University of Minnesota's Division of Environmental Health Sciences, Jeff Spangenberger from Argonne National Laboratory, Bernard Olson from the University of Minnesota Department of Mechanical Engineering, and Gene Dash and Jim Darcy from General Motors and the U.S. Council for Automotive Research. The motivation for this talk is that approximately 15 million automobiles reach the end of their useful lives each year in the United States. By weight, 84% of these vehicles are recycled. Vehicle recycling is important internationally. In Europe, about 8 to 9 million vehicles per year are recycled. The plastic parts from these vehicles are shredded for potential reuse. Automobile manufacturers are increasingly using plastics reinforced with nanomaterials in their vehicles, and these nanocomposites are being recycled. The U.S. automobile industry has been concerned that the shredding of nanocomposites might release free nanoparticles into the air, and because the inhalation of nanoparticles raises a health concern, we were asked to experimentally investigate if nanomaterials are released into the air when nanocomposite plastics used in vehicles are shredded for recycling. We constructed a test apparatus at Argonne National Laboratory in a facility that studies vehicle recycling. A small-scale granulator, a machine capable of shredding plastics, was placed inside a filtered enclosure. Attached to the enclosure was a duct from which we could draw air samples into a variety of instruments capable of measuring particle number, surface area, and mass concentrations, and particle size distributions by number and mass. We shredded small test plaques of three different polypropylene plastics, plain polypropylene resin, polypropylene resin reinforced with 20% talc by weight, which is a conventional composite plastic, and the nanocomposite, polypropylene resin reinforced with 5% by weight Montmorillonite nanoclay. These test plaques were fed into the granulator at a rate of 4 per minute for 2 hours for each of the plastics. This is a diagram of our apparatus. The air was pulled into the enclosure containing the granulator through a HEPA filter by a fan unit. A pair of gloves like those used in glove boxes was inserted into the enclosure to allow the test plaques to be picked up and placed into the granulator. We were able to measure the temperature and relative humidity inside the enclosure using an instrument called a Q-Track. The air was drawn from the enclosure through our test duct at a rate of 190 cubic feet per minute or 320 cubic meters per hour. We sampled the air from the duct at two locations using a variety of aerosol instruments. These instruments included a P-Track ultrafine particle counter that measures number concentrations for particles with diameters ranging from about 20 nanometers up to about 1 micrometer or 1,000 nanometers. We used a Fast Mobility Particle Sizer, or FMPS, to measure the size distribution by number of particles ranging from 5.6 nanometers up to about 560 nanometers. We used a handheld optical particle counter to measure larger particles, those ranging from about 0.3 micrometers or 300 nanometers up to about 10 micrometers in diameter. A nanoparticle aerosol monitor measured surface area concentrations of particles ranging from about 10 nanometers up to about 1,000 nanometers or 1 micrometer in diameter. We used a dust track photometer with a PM2.5 inlet to measure mass concentrations of particles ranging from about 100 nanometers or 0.1 micrometer up to 2.5 micrometers in diameter. A Moody cascade impactor was used to sample particles onto substrates that were subsequently observed in a scanning electron microscope, or SEM, to determine their morphology. As I mentioned previously, the Q-Track was used to measure temperature and relative humidity inside the granulator enclosure. Here are a couple of images of our test apparatus. On the left, you can see my co-author, Jeff Spangenberger, who is feeding test plaques every 15 seconds into the granulator inside the enclosure. You can see that the chamber is at negative pressure relative to the room because the gloves stick straight out into the chamber due to the pressure difference. Leaving away from the chamber, you can see our sampling duct and some of the instruments that are sampling air from the duct. <laughs> 
On the right, you can see the enclosure and duct from the opposite side and some more of our instruments, including the FMPS, the Moody Impactor, the Dust Track, and others. Moving on to the results, I'm going to show you a set of three figures on each page showing particle concentration versus time taken with a single instrument for each type of plastic. At the top will be the plain polypropylene test plaques. In the middle will be the conventional talc-filled polypropylene composite test plaques. And at the bottom will be the nanoclay-filled polypropylene nanocomposite test plaques. The figures are color-coded. The orange data represent the particle concentrations in the room during a period when the enclosure door was open and we pulled room air directly into the apparatus using the fan unit. The blue data are background concentrations after we shut the enclosure door and air entered the apparatus through the HEPA filter. The green data are the background concentrations when the enclosure door was shut and the granulator was turned on with no plaques being shredded. We will primarily look at the red data, which were taken over two hours when the test plaques were being shredded. So, on this page, we are looking at the particle number concentrations measured over time using the P-Track. The plain resin plaques exhibit the highest particle concentrations among the three types of plastic during the shredding period, averaging on the order of 15,000 particles per cubic centimeter. Although concentrations bounce up and down over short intervals, the average was steady throughout the shredding period. The concentrations measured when the conventional talc-filled resin plaques were shredded were much lower, just above background concentrations and considerably lower than room concentrations. The number concentrations when the nanocomposite plaques were shredded were approximately 5,000 particles per cubic centimeter, higher than the talc-filled resin plaques, but lower than the plain resin plaques. Particle number concentrations can be calculated from the fast mobility particle sizer data by summing the particle levels measured in each size interval. We found higher concentrations from the FMPS than from the P-Track. Because the FMPS measures particles with diameters down to 5.6 nanometers, whereas the P-Track only measures particles down to about 20 nanometers, the higher levels seen in the FMPS data indicate that many particles smaller than 20 nanometers were generated when the test plaques were shredded. Comparisons of the concentrations measured using the FMPS for the three types of plastic show the same ordering as we found with the P-Track, with the plain polypropylene resin having the highest concentrations, followed by the nanocomposite resin, and then the conventional talc-filled resin. Looking at surface area concentrations, we see the same relationship among the different kinds of plastic, with the plain resin exhibiting the highest concentrations, the conventional plastic having the lowest, and the nanocomposite resin being in between. You can see here and on the two previous slides that many of the concentrations we observed when the test plaques were being shredded were of the same magnitude or maybe even lower, in some cases, than the particle levels in the room. When we look at the dust track data during the shredding periods, we can see that the mass concentrations measured were essentially the same as the background mass concentrations for all three test materials, except at the very beginning of the measurements with the plain resin, which was the first resin we tested, when we saw a spike in concentration at the very beginning of the shredding period. This spike is probably due to the granulator having some large particles from a previous study attached to its blades that did not come off until we started shredding our test plaques. We can see that concentrations fall back down to background levels very quickly following the spike. Overall, the mass concentration data suggests that few large particles are generated during shredding because they would be the ones that would contribute to an increase in mass concentrations. This table shows the mean concentrations measured for each type of resin with the four instruments we've already looked at, as well as for the Aerotrack 9306 optical particle counter, which looked at number concentrations for larger particles. You can see for the P-Track and the FMPS the same results that we saw in the figures, where the plain resin produced higher concentrations than the nanocomposite material, and the nanocomposite material had higher particle concentrations than the talc-filled resin. The same pattern is observed for the surface area concentrations. For particles 300 nanometers in diameter and larger, the Aerotrack 9306 data show that number concentrations were very low. This is consistent with the dust track observations where we saw that mass concentrations during shredding were close to the background levels when the granulator was turned off. How do the particle number concentrations observed in our tests compare with real-world particle levels seen in other research studies? 
In 2004, Coolbush et al. looked at carbon black production and found concentrations greater than 100,000 particles per cubic centimeter, which is higher than any of the levels that we were able to observe. My colleague Tom Peters from the University of Iowa and his co-authors studied an engine machining and assembly plant, and they observed between 140 and 830,000 particles per cubic centimeter, most of which were attributable to direct fired heating for the facility. Macaulay et al., looking at a beryllium metal and alloys plant, measured particle number concentrations greater than 1 billion particles per cubic centimeter, an exceedingly high level, at one location within that plant. In this study, our maximum concentration, observed with the plain resin using the FMPS, was only 62,000 particles per cubic centimeter, which was lower than any of the maximum concentrations from the other papers. In a real workplace where plastics are being shredded by a larger machine at a faster pace, we anticipate that concentrations might be about 10 times higher than in this experimental study. Even with this adjustment, number concentrations produced by shredding of plastics would not be out of line with what has been observed in other operations that may generate airborne nanoparticles. This figure shows the frequency distribution measured by the fast mobility particle sizer for each of the test resins as a function of particle diameter on the horizontal axis. As we saw in the concentration measurement results previously, the plain resin in black exhibits the highest frequency distribution followed by the nanocomposite resin in blue and then the talc-filled conventional resin in orange. In particular, the highest points in the distributions are for particles about 10 nanometers in diameter and smaller. There are smaller peaks at around 20 nanometers for the plain resin and the nanocomposite material, but not for the talc-filled resin. All this is important because the smallest dimension expected from the nanoclay composite material is about 30 nanometers, so we did not expect to observe particles 10 nanometers or even 20 nanometers in size. Because these particles are so small and because they are present when each of the three resins are shredded, it's difficult to see how they could be derived from nanomaterials. Scanning electron microscope images of samples collected using the Moody impactor show that similar particles were captured from each of the three resins as they were shredded. Individual spherical particles may be a result of volatilization of the polymer as it is heated by shredding, followed by immediate recondensation in the surrounding air. We also see chain aggregates of spheres, as well as compact and more spread out agglomerates of smaller particles. For the nanocomposite resin, the smallest particles we could observe using the SCM were those in this image, which were about 23 to 26 nanometers in diameter. On the left is a view of the particles using secondary electron imaging. The particles are easily distinguished from the background substrate. When we look at the same particles using backscatter electron imaging, we would expect the particles to stand out brightly from the polycarbonate substrate if they contained elements like silicon, magnesium, calcium, and aluminum present in the nanoclay. However, they blend into the background, indicating that they are probably composed of the resin itself. To summarize, our findings indicate that the particle concentrations that we measured are typical of levels of particles found in industrial settings. The lowest particle concentrations we measured were when the conventional talc-filled polypropylene resin plaques were shredded. We observed fewer nanoparticles being generated from the nanocomposite resin test plaques than when the plain polypropylene resin plaques were shredded. For all three materials, the count median diameters of the particles generated during shredding were about 10 nanometers in diameter. SEM images suggest that the nanoclay was not liberated from the nanocomposite resin. Instead, most of the nanoparticles appear to be formed from the polypropylene resin itself, perhaps by condensation of polymer vapors produced by heat when the test plaques were shredded. This hypothesis for particle formation requires further investigation. Other authors have produced results similar to ours. For example, in 2009, Bello and co-authors were able to observe the cutting of carbon and aluminum composite materials created with and without carbon nanotubes as reinforcing agents. The most relevant figures to look at here are the ones on the left that show particle size distributions at the nanoscale. When the materials were cut, the figures show that the composites containing carbon nanotubes generated the same or lower concentrations of nanoscale particles than those without the nanotubes. In conclusion, our measurements suggest that the recycling of nanoclay reinforced plastics does not have a strong potential to generate more nanoparticles into the air than recycling of conventional plastics.
It also does not have a strong potential to generate unique airborne particles composed of the composite nanomaterial. For more information, you can contact me or refer to our paper that was published in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Hygiene in 2012. Complete citations for all works referred to in this presentation are provided in the paper. Thank you for listening to our talk.